webinar on industrial policy, green subsidies, and the WTO. My name is David Kleiman. I'll be your host for the next hour. Now, as we know, vast amounts of industrial subsidies are currently being dispersed in the world's largest economies to accelerate the transition to net zero and boost competitiveness. These subsidies are, have already started to generate international trade and political frictions and so divisions among governments of poorer and richer countries. At the same time, public financing of green industrial policies increasingly places national industrial decarbonization efforts on a collision course with international subsidy rules and national countervailing duty laws and regulations. International cooperation will arguably be essential to diffuse such tensions before they escalate and impede effective climate policy rollouts, for instance, by triggering economic countermeasures that create new barriers to trade and clean goods, by undermining political support for the, for the transition uh, to net zero uh, in third country jurisdictions and by reinforcing international conflict lines. Options for international cooperation could include convergence around a code of conduct, best practices or other forms of soft law, or even updated international rules to guide national public authorities towards minimizing negative cross-border economic spillovers and maximizing environmental externalities of industrial policies at the same time. Green lighting a category of first best, capping second best, and reiterating prohibitions of entirely undesirable subsidy practices may present one solution that is admittedly, admittedly very ambitious at the current, in the current geopolitical context. A more incremental and perhaps pragmatic approach could prioritize enhanced transparency and empirical analysis of cross-border economic costs and environmental benefits of subsidy measures and draft rules on the basis of recent empirical evidence. A related issue for consideration is which organizations should advance the technical and political deliberations in this area. International cooperation will also be needed to ensure that the perspectives of countries at different levels of development are reflected. And along with the wider considerations of sustainable development in the context of international commitments to a just transition to net zero. Of course, we may consider these questions ever more salient in light of the upcoming WTO ministerial conference in February 26th to 29th. And I'm very, very grateful to have four distinguished panelists with me today who kindly agreed to discuss the mentioned issues uh, with me and amongst ourselves, notably Ignacio Garcia Becero, uh, Director of the Multilateral Affairs Strategy of Multilateral Affairs and Strategy at the European Commission CT Trade. Julia Nielsen, who's the Deputy Director of the OECD's Trade and, and Agriculture Directorate. Ilaria Espa, who is the Professor for International Economic Law at USI in uh, Lugano, and who is also affiliated with the World Trade Institute in Bern. And finally, Carolyn Deer, Director of, and Founder of the Forum on Trade, Environment, Sustainability, and the SDGs, the Test Forum in Geneva. Now, before we turn to a discussion of potential policy recommendations to WTO members going into MC13 next month, let's start with the first round of comments on what we identify as the actual accurate definition of the problem here. Ignacio, uh, over the past year, the EU and the member states were very focused on the analysis of the Inflation Reduction Act and the EU's response to the IRA. Now, there is certainly no shortage of voices that blame China for the perceived need for increasingly aggressive industrial policy interventions in the West. And I'd be very curious to learn where you and your colleagues situate China in the current global interventionist dynamic. Over to you, Ignacio. Well, uh, thanks a lot, uh, David. And it's a real pleasure to have the opportunity to talk uh, here about uh, one of the most challenging issues that we are going to be discussing the, in MC13. Now, the first point which I wanted to, to make is that certainly, although a lot of the focus, a lot of the attention to, over the last year or so has been to, on the impact of the IRA, and there are, of course, still very significant concerns about the impact of the IRA, concerns about subsidization to, and about the need to, to reinforce uh, international disciplines on subsidies predate the IRA. It is important to note that it was already in 2019 
that the uh, United States, China and Japan decided to start uh, a trilateral process of discussion to, on how to reinforce uh, disciplines on subsidies, which led to a joint statement uh, with some ideas about how disciplines could be reinforced that was issued just at the beginning of the pandemic. I think it was actually in January 2020. And it is clear that there are concerns uh, about uh, subsidization in China, which are quite critical and which would need to be tackled in any effort uh, to see how to strengthen the disciplines internationally on subsidies. I mean, there are basically two types of concern. One have to do with subsidy intensity. And I think all the evidence is that in a number of sectors, uh, subsidization in China is massive. It is actually having a very significant impact uh, on global uh, trade and investment uh, through the generation to, of overcapacities. And you have seen that in a number of sectors where it is uh, steel, aluminum, to solar panels, uh, shipbuilding, or now more recently in e vehicles. So this is clearly one of the issues that is an important uh, problem to, and which in any international discussion about how to modernize and strengthen the disciplines on subsidies would need to be tackled. The second type of concern have to do with the lack of transparency of the intervention. Most of the support that I have referred to are not classical budgetary subsidies. It takes the form of below market financing often channels for straight enterprises. And of course, Julia might want to talk a little bit more about that because the OECD has been doing a lot of very valuable research of the issue. So the reason why I was mentioning this is because if we are going to be looking into how to strengthen or modernize international disciplines or subsidies, it is not going to be possible just to simply limit the discussion to green subsidies. It will have to be a broader discussion and the question about green subsidies would need to be put uh, in a somewhat uh, more broader, uh, broader uh, pers uh, perspective. Now, I'm sure there are going to be a lot of discussions by the other panelists uh, about the question about green subsidies. The second point which I wanted to make has to do with the complexities, which are actually linked to identifying the, the impact of subsidies uh, on trade uh, and on the environment. Now, I'm not going to try to offer a whole typology about the different type of intervention that we are facing, but it's clear that we have quite a diverse uh, type of instruments and issues that would need to be discussed if there was going to be any attempt to see how to handle the green subsidies. I mean, first, there is those uh, subsidies which have a negative impact both on trade and on the environment. And one can think about three classical examples on that. Trade distorting the domestic support, if you are in the agricultural sector, if you are looking into production to sub link subsidies, if you are link in looking into input subsidies, it is clear that those subsidies are having the distortive impacts on trade, but are also having a negative impact on the environment. So there will be a good trade and a good environmental rationale to do more in terms of disciplining or reduction, to, reduction those subsidies. A second example would be those subsidies which are actually being given to carbon intensive industrial sectors. If you are subsidizing the steel industry or the aluminum industry in a way that it generates uh, overcapacities, you are not only distorting the international trade, you are also contributing towards the increase of emissions. Unless, of course, those subsidies are somehow targeted, linked to the decarbonization commitments to be undertaken by the industry. And there's the whole question about uh, fossil fuel subsidies, and particularly the most distortive type of fossil fuel subsidies. So first, you have all those cases in that you could argue that subsidies are having negative impacts both on trade and on the environment. But then, of course, you also have those cases in which subsidies are designed with the objective of having some positive environmental effects. But then the real issue is going to be how you design the subsidies in a manner which are environmentally effective and cause minimum or no distortion on trade. And that, quite frankly, raises a lot of complex questions. I mean, I'm not going to enter into them in detail because I'm sure that uh, the other panelists may want uh, to talk about that. 
But if you are talking about consumption subsidies, there are different types of consumption subsidies. There's the classical uh, non-discriminatory consumption subsidy, which is clearly uh, consistent with our WTO rules. There is subsidies which are linked to local content requirements, which are clearly inconsistent with WTO rules. There are a number of situations in between, which are much more, uh, much more difficult uh, to, to tackle. There are those subsidies which can have an impact on the location of firms. And these are the classical subsidies where you have a concern about uh, competition to, for investment and distortions which can be generated uh, as a result. There are subsidies which may be linked to investment in new decarbonization to technologies. And there's, of course, also the question about how to deal with uh, uh, measures which are taken to partially compensate uh, the impact of carbon pricing. A classical example would be free allowances for those countries that have something like an emission trading scheme. So there's quite a diverse universe uh, of different uh, type uh, of interventions. Uh, and as I said, trying to identify what is the best way to have disciplines that relate uh, to these different type of interventions it's going to be complex, and I think that uh, it's not reason not to do it, but I think clearly there's quite a lot of, of complexities attached to it. And it can only be, in my view, part of a much broader exercise to have a better understanding about different ways in which the state intervenes uh, to achieve certain industrial policy objectives. And only when there's a better understanding, you could really look into the question about what is the right type of policy response, uh, to what extent this is rules. And we will come, I think, to that issue in the second round of, of our uh, of our intervention. So I think I will just uh, I will just leave it at that for the time being. Thank, thank you so much, Ignacio. And I, I did warn you that I, I was going to ask you a, a tiny follow-up question um, uh, that goes a little bit, a tiny bit more into detail into uh, what we may already know uh, uh, about the response. And you know, in terms of uh, the IRA, uh, we, we do have um, a response measure. Uh, we've recently seen the first uh, commission approval of 900 million euros of state aid for a battery production plant in Germany under the infamous matching mechanism, uh, which is provided for under Section 2.8 of the not-so-temporary crisis and transition framework, extended last March, uh, meant to prevent EU investors to relocate to the US. Also in March of last year, President von der Leyen and President Biden did announce that a transatlantic clean energy incentive dialogue uh, to form part of the Transatlantic Trade and Technology Council to coordinate, quote, uh, our respective incentives programs that they're mutually reinforcing. Um, what could we possibly reasonably expect um, in the upcoming uh, TTC and perhaps coordination transatlantically going uh, into WTO deliberations on uh, these clearly uh, investment distorting subsidies? There, there is a subsidy raise ongoing. Would you have a take on this for us? Well, I mean, it is clear that uh, our objective uh, would be to try to agree on better international disciplines on subsidies. This being said, until such time as we have reached uh, an understanding about better international disciplines, we need to be in a position to, to defend uh, the interests of our industry and to avoid the uh, distortions uh, in the level playing field. So when we actually take an action like the matching uh, uh, instrument, uh, or when we actually take uh, trade defense action to, to defend against the distortive impact uh, of subsidies in our market, this is basically to ensure that we can maintain the, a level uh, playing field. Now, it is obvious that as much as possible, we would aim to, to try to deal with concerns uh, about the IRA through dialogue, and we have established mechanisms for such a dialogue in the context of the TTC. And we also hope that the United States will be able to agree with us that we need to have an international discussion to, about the interface, about trade and industrial policy, which is one of the objectives that we are actually aiming to pursue in the next ministerial conference of DMC-13. But clearly, we cannot actually be in a situation in which uh, we just simply uh, let... Uh, subsidies having a negative impact uh, on the European uh, business uh, or having a distortive impact of investment without having instruments uh, to respond uh, to those uh, to those uh, to those uh, circumstances. Thank you so much Ignacio. Um, over to you Julia. Uh, in the past the OECD has championed uh, empirical analysis 
of agriculture and fishery subsidies in particular has now stepped up efforts to provide transparency and analysis of the new wave of industrial subsidies as part of the four international organi organizations initiative, uh, including the World Bank, the WTO and the IMF. And I'd be glad if you could uh, highlight some of the key findings and insights of that so far ongoing effort. Julia, over to you. Sure, it's a, it's a pleasure and thanks for having us here. So look, we, we've been looking at different kinds of subsidies on agriculture, fisheries, fossil fuels and now industrials for a while. So I'm going to kind of, it's a huge question, but I'm going to highlight kind of five things that, that we've learned in this time. Thank I you. think the first one is that um, subsidy transparency is absolutely critical. We know quite a lot about agriculture, reasonable amount about fisheries, um, quite a bit about fossil fuels, but uh, not enough about industrials. And industrials in particular has been an area of endless creativity by governments. I mean, I think as Ignacio mentioned, what we've done um, when we looked at industrial subsidies is we didn't ask what do governments give because there's not enough transparency on that. We said, what do firms receive? And when we asked that question, we saw an awful lot of cheap loans below market finance, usually funneled through a state-owned or influenced bank. Then we saw an awful lot of government equity. And that's not just the one-off effect of the equity injection as a subsidy. It's when the government stays in long after any other uh, investor would have left. So there's an ongoing subsidy effect. And this also matters because we see that firms with government ownership, and this isn't just SOEs, this is firms with anything from 5 or 10 or 15% onwards, get Firms with 25% of government ownership get more of all forms of support than, than other firms, and they also give support. More importantly, because we don't often know where the state is, what we think is a transaction between two private firms is actually a subsidy being given by the state because one of those firms is the state. And the other thing that we saw is that add in trade measures into this mix and put a uh, an export ban or an export restriction on an upstream ingredient and you've got a further subsidy effect on a downstream industry. So all in all, first lesson, you need to track all kinds of industrial subsidies and it's not very easy to come up with that common idea of what's a subsidy. Second lesson is about what's a green subsidy. And I think we started off by saying, okay, so you look at the objective. But often subsidies have uh, multiple objectives. So my objective may be uh, I want to create green jobs domestically. I want to have a green tech advantage. I want to tackle global climate change. And are those three objectives equal from the purposes of what we're trying to, to green light? Subsidies are also often kind of mislabeled. This can be for political reasons. So it may be that if you call it a climate change, uh, it wouldn't get through the parliament. So you call it something else. Uh, but equally, we know in the history of subsidies, and people have heard me say this before, nobody ever said this is my re-election subsidy. There's always a really noble and good motive so that there's a, a risk there. So we've tended to say when we look at subsidies, we look at not the stated objective, we look at the design and the impact. But even then, trying to work out what the greenness and an impact can be quite tricky. And I'll give you a couple of examples of why. One is that this can change over time. So biofuels look like a great idea, then we realised it led to land use change. Uh, you may think that there can be tension. I'm going to put solar panels on my fishing boats, which is really good in terms of fossil fuels, but terrible in terms of I've increased fishing capacity and unsustainable fishing. So we can see as well that sometimes subsidies allow for clean up something local, but leave a global problem untouched. So that's a there can be a, a lot of political and analytical debate about that. Um, the third is a point that, that Ignacio made really um, very well, which is not all subsidies are the same. There are some that the trading system is very worried about and there are others they're less worried about. So on one hand, I have my non-discriminatory consumption subsidies, by and large not a problem, through to my distorting production subsidies. Uh, but even then we find we have a lot of discussions about, well, is it that production subsidy, is it potentially environmentally harmful? Depends if there's constraints on the input use. So you get a lot of devil in the detail here and a lot of it depends, uh, including when you have some of those consumption subsidies are for low income households and fossil fuels and high energy prices. So they have different economic impacts, they have different spillovers and different reform paths. 
The other point, the, the fourth point I'd make is that we do know that understanding the kind of these market impacts as well, the other the other test that I think Ignacio quite rightly pointed to, can also be challenging. I mean, one of the things we find is when you're looking at a subsidy in the presence of a global value chain, sometimes it's not immediately apparent who the ultimate beneficiary is. It may be that your domestic production subsidy is primarily actually benefiting the input users um, in, a, in another country. But we also see, and this is particularly important in the green debate, that, okay, a subsidy may be making something cheaper in global markets, and that's perhaps good for dissemination in the short term, but in the medium term, or am I actually forcing out of the market more innovative, cheaper and better suppliers? Uh, and am I actually increasing market concentration that then also leads to a whole bunch of other risks? So you need lots of data and analysis. So the last point I'd make on this is the other big lesson from subsidies is whatever you do, you're going to have for a while because these have proven very hard to reform. So, uh, you know, we see that it's... Um, the, the kinds of factors that we've pointed to mean that you really do have to think carefully. You really do have to get your dirt under your fingernails on this issue. You know, transparency is key, but it, it does take a lot of digging. Design matters, but it's hard to get right. And hitting the target has proven to be challenging. So I think those are probably the lessons we've, we've learned so far. That is uh, an incredibly Good guide uh, for further uh, for the further discussion uh, coming up now, especially with regard to one issue that is the peace clause. I mean, if we don't know what a green subsidy is and who the beneficiaries of uh, of those subsidies are, um, you know, how can we get a, a peace clause uh, a right among countries that, for instance, the U.S. some U.S. NG environmental NGOs are requesting as much as the European Commission also uh, in transatlantic negotiations with regard to subsidies on the decarbonization of existing installations. I'm going to come to that question in a second uh, with Ilaria, to, to, to Ilaria, but, uh, but uh, first of all, I wanted to ask Ilaria, uh, who has been working on environmental subsidies in the context of international economic law for many years now, um, uh, if she would agree with those who say that the current set of international subsidy rules is um, actually outdated, and if so, uh, why that would be the case. Over to you, Ilaria. Thank you so much, David, for having me here. It's a pleasure, and many thanks for this question, which is, to a certain extent, one of those existential questions in the WTO for a number of years now, and uh, it certainly regained prominence, at least since the very first of a series of cases that uh, within the WTO two settlement system started targeting uh, renewable energy subsidy programs under the WTO agreement on subsidies and countervailing measures, the famous ASCM agreement. And I must say that this stream of cases puzzled mostly and especially non-WTO specialists, especially considering the absence of WTO cases that actually targeted, on the other hand, fossil fuel subsidies, despite them being definitely way larger in scale than renewable energy support programs. And this has been alluded to already when it comes to the environmental, huge environmental costs of these, of these subsidies. Now, that said, um, and uh, I would say um, that there has been a generalized sense, indeed, that the very architecture of the SCM agreement was actually unsuitable to foster the use of green uh, subsidies more generally, and I very much agree with what has been said with respect to the complexity and the very differentiated universe of what we normally label for simplicity purposes green subsidies. But there's really very much been in the international economic law community a sense that, especially after kind of the renewable energy, even the good times, just again for simplicity purposes, would not be uh, uh, necessarily uh, dealt with under the SCM agreement in the ideal way, not just because of a lack of policy space, but I would argue because of the lack of legal certainty of which exactly would be the policy space available under under the agreement. And, and the Canada Renewable Energy case was a very creative, very interesting case, but it was interpreted at least at first as basically 
um, let's say, uh, providing for an ad hoc judicial solution to avoid potential classes between subsidies rules into WTO and climate change mitigation goals. And, and it left up with a sense of the fact that the number of defining features of the agreement actually are problematic from a climate standpoint. On the one hand, the trade injury focus of the agreement, the high evidentiary burdens that's entailed in meeting the definitions under the agreement of subsidies, specificity, adverse effects, and uh, probably most importantly, at least in the debate, the lack of an exemption clause that would allow under certain conditions to pursue uh, legitimate objectives such as climate mitigation goals uh, through subsidies, especially after the expiration of Article 8 of the agreement. In other words, basically what I'm saying is under the current disciplines, uh, we do target any specific subsidies that is trade distortive, no matter it's rational. And I very much agree with Julia. Sometimes it's also very difficult to understand what's the uh, winning rationale out of a multiplicity of goals within these very complex, massive programs. Um, but again, irrespective also of its environmental effects, whether positive or negative. This means basically that if we do have a discriminatory green industrial subsidy, this would straightforwardly fit within the category of prohibited uh, and considered per se distortive subsidies because uh, uh, we have basically uh, a local content requirement that's enshrined, uh, whereas if we have green subsidies that are not openly discriminatory, they still remain actionable and countervailable if they cause adverse effects, if we find injury, notification, or serious prejudice. And we do assist, actually, and this is also what worries me, in the proliferation of trade remedy actions on green technologies because they also, uh, and we now know even more about it, they also come with potentially huge environmental costs because they would reduce themselves diffusion of green technology due to the higher prices, they would erode the competitiveness of clean sources of energy, and ultimately they would disrupt clean supply chains. So to sum up, one important limit is really that these disciplines are not designed to differentiate among different types of, of the subsidies uh, that may have different types of effects, as it was already mentioned, and they're not even designed to set uh, for a sort of balancing of proportionality test that would weight these positive or negative effects both on trade and on climate, as was already mentioned by, by Niasho. Those can, can vary and they can, depending on the specifics, lead to different results. And this, most importantly, has also determined a lack of expertise within the WTO to evaluate these sort of uh, different types of effects based on empirical studies and scientifically found metrics. And there's clearly a transparency and knowledge gap that it's very urgent to fill. And I very much uh, value the OECD work in this respect. So I leave it there and... Uh, I, w I was just going to say, uh, um, uh, Ilaria, uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for this, uh, you know, really uh, good and comprehensive overview of this very complex uh, subject and, and topic. And uh, indeed, uh, uh, you know, cry for help towards the OECD to provide the um, the technical expertise to uh, and and uh, and and transfer it and submit it uh, to WTO negotiators when it comes to uh, you know suggesting perhaps sustainability criteria and an analyzing um, uh, subsidies on the basis of sustainability, which is a, a highly political uh, exercise in the end of the day, uh, of course. So uh, there's a lot of uh, devil in uh, the detail. Larry, I had one one more question for you because this is on the minds of of of, of many WTO uh, or many in, environmental NGOs in the in the US um, and uh, dis discussing with other. other colleagues recently, as well as, you know, on the Commission side, is this idea of a peace clause uh, for, you know, among governments who uh, who, who say, we, we're not going to litigate, we're not going to sue you in the WTO for uh, for your, you know, what we call an environmental subsidy, uh, not a re-election subsidy. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, sort of, we, we have this call on the on the Commission side as well, who, you know, everyone is, also, of course, looking at their own programs and what they want to defend. The European Commission is, is, is keen on defending subsidies and decarbonizing existing uh, uh, IT sector installations. Now, how realistic is that? Is, are we faring better? You know, renegotiating the SEM agreement seems incredibly difficult, if not impossible at the moment. But is, is a peace clause among governments perhaps something something easier? Could that be done? Uh, what's your take? Um, 
Uh, very many thanks for these questions, David. And, and, and indeed, there's been a lot of talk about the potential for this uh, peace clause, which is sort of in between, between the Harlow approach model that you were just mentioning, right? Incredibly hard, and we can elaborate perhaps in the second round of questions on the technicalities that would be involved into a multilateral uh, to be agreed amendment to the STM agreements for the purposes of having or re-establishing non-actionable categories of subsidies and a soft law approach on the other hand, right? There's something in between because it is really about agreeing on, as you mentioned, non-actionality actionability and non countervailability But again, here, uh, at least of certain uh, green subsidies at certain conditions, right? And then this sort of debate uh, from a substantive point of view is very much similar to the challenges entailed into defining a very sufficiently calibrated exemption clause within the SCM agreement. Now, on the procedural side, it may entail less challenges because you can basically have a geometry variable there, right? It can be paradoxically, even unilaterally uh, agreed, right? But it can be also bilateral, plurilateral, etc. So, my take is that it would not be very meaningful if we do not really include the countries which have the capacity to impose highly impactful countervailing uh, uh, duties and certainly the big players in the subsidy raise, as you were mentioning. So that's the reason why there's a lot of talk also on the transatlantic side about the possibility for the peace clause to make it a credible uh, solution, at least temporarily. Um, perhaps not as ambitious as an amendment to the SCM um, agreement. Uh, but uh, to me, the important thing is that it would be necessary to devise it in a way that also uh, supports, in a way, uh, less developed countries as well, right? So to include conditions for, uh, and, and probably Caroline is going to talk about that, because when we are in this game, there's huge uh, distributional uh, developmental implications also of these uh, instruments when it comes to those uh, countries. Um, but uh, again, um, if you look at the big players in the U.S. at the moment, uh, the, the 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 statute doesn't include the public interest clause, contrary to the EU, for instance, and other actors such as Canada. Uh, so we do find, for instance, these sort of clauses to be integrated in new generation of preferential trade agreements negotiated by the EU. Uh, but certainly, when it comes to the U.S. <laughs> Uh, I would say it's probably less less um, uh, realistic, but uh, let, let's see. Let's see how the debate progresses on that front. Thank you very much, Ilaria. Um, and uh, yes, we were talking about uh, developing countries, least developed countries, and uh, the fact that uh, such a peace clause among a rich club of nations uh, who is at the same time uh, applying CBAMs and carbon tariffs uh, to the rest of the world uh, may not be the right idea for uh, or the right notion for uh, the just transition, uh, but perhaps uh, with more inclusive provisions and and climate finance, etc. But that's that's another discussion. Carolyn, you regularly uh, interact with WTO delegates in Geneva uh, who participate in the WTO's trade and environmental sustainability structured discussions, the so-called test D in which by now 76 WTO members participate, including the EU, the US and China. Um, and I'd be glad if you could share some of your impressions that you have gathered uh, with particular respect to the views from lower middle income countries and least developed countries on the question of subsidy reform um, uh, and you know, with respect to the previous comments. Over to you, Karen. Uh, thank you so much, David, and thank you for the opportunity to be with you today. So I am going to try to share some of the perspectives that we hear from WTO delegates in Geneva um, in the context of the TESD discussions, but also more broadly in discussions of environment that arise across a range of different uh, committees at the WTO. So the first thing I wanted to, to highlight was that I we see sort of four different themes in discussion. And really, it's about how to balance climate ambition with concerns around fairness, domestic political economy constraints, and coherence in terms of broader international trade cooperation uh, priorities for climate action. So in terms of ambition, um, we see recognition from a broad diversity of countries about the need for urgent action and scale-up of action, um, which will involve and necessitate um, 
governments to use industrial policies to implement the kind of change we need at speed and scale. All countries recognise that in order to achieve some of the goals the international community has set out, tripling renewable energy capacity, doubling energy efficiency by 2030, transitioning away from fossil fuels, addressing issues of resilience and adaptation, responding to losses associated with climate impacts, all of these will require huge public investment as well as private investment. Now, there are a range of different ways, as Ignacio said, that um, states can intervene through industrial policies to scale up um, at speed um, in, in order to meet their climate change goals and priorities. And green subsidies are one of the tools that they have to drive and de-risk and align private investment with climate goals. So I think there's that recognition out there. But a second perspective or theme is around fairness. So how do you leverage action fast in ways that are fair and are consistent with wider sustainable development commitments and priorities. So as we scale up and as governments seek to push their, and stakeholders seek to push their governments to scale up public investment, how can they do so in ways that account for these international commitments? The third theme is this recognition of domestic political economy constraints. All countries face such constraints when it comes to building and sustaining political support for climate action. There are concerns about employment, shifting of investment, national security, competitiveness on the global stage, and just being left behind in the green transition. This is an issue for both developed and developing countries, not just the major, you know, the US, um, China and Europe, but for a range of countries of all levels of development. And then the fourth consideration is about what is necessary to build and sustain long-term cooperation on trade. And here, something that we hear from, especially from developing countries, is the way in which developed countries in particular act in terms of trade-related climate policies has an impact on trade cooperation more broadly and also on the climate for climate cooperation, the, you know, the, the environment for that. So we need action at home urgently. Um, especially in the largest economies, but we need that action to be undertaken in ways that also supports and enables other countries to thrive while undertaking a green transition and to pursue climate resilient development. So these are some of the points um, that we hear in the discussion um, that, um, that, and, and in our discussions with delegations. And I think a key point here is that we need to find ways to cooperate on these climate-related trade measures that can sustain um, and broader cooperation. We need trade cooperation on a range of different issues, on regulation, standards, government procurement, tariffs, market access. Um, we need to find ways that trade and trade cooperation can catalyze investment in key um, climate-relevant goods and services and so on. So we can't afford to untangle all of the other trade cooperation we need. So these are, these are some of the, um, the concerns that we hear. And specifically from developing countries, I think that whilst they welcome the scale up of investments and developed countries committing money and resources to fulfilling their climate obligations, they see the discussion of green subsidies as part of a broader discussion on green industrial policies and want to see more attention to their development and trade effects. And a key issue here that many developing countries underline is they have very limited fiscal space to provide subsidies and to finance climate transformation. UNCTAD recently noted that 3.3 billion people live in countries that spend more on debt interest payments than on health or education. Most developing countries have limited resources to finance, um, to spend public money through subsidies or even through government procurement. The cost of borrowing capital for developing countries for green investments is much, much higher than for developing countries. If green subsidies in developed countries make investment, they're relatively cheaper, you increase that imbalance. There's also very limited um, amount of climate FDI goes to um, developing countries. And of course, there's the wider context of failures on climate finance. So for them, this is the setting within which this discussion on green subsidies um, takes place. So just briefly to close on the things that follow for this is I think that there's a sense of unfairness that resources are available for massive domestic investments that focus on domestic competitiveness, but not on international commitments such as climate finance and aid for trade. There's a concern in countries about their own pos positioning and competitiveness in green transition, wider concerns about how they will compete in this green economy. 
Um, and that's in the context of long-standing concerns about asymmetries in terms of market access and market distortions, including from environmentally and economically harmful subsidies, um, such as in the agricultural sector that they have alluded to in the past. So they're, you know, they, they would see that this discussion on green subsidies needs to occur in the context of a wider discussion around in, in green industrial policy and the flexibilities that they may need in terms of a range of different in, issues, financing, investments, intellectual property rights, tech transfer, and so on, in order to be able to um, pursue their own green industrial objectives. So I think just finally, on a more positive note, I think that there is an interest in discussion of green subsidies. Um, but one that's linked to a discussion of green industrial policies and how they can use these to support climate resilient development. So some of the questions that we hear is how can we ensure that green subsidies provided by major economies are non-discriminatory and used to leverage and support investments in developing countries and to support their participation in relevant supply chains? Can we use this to develop more virtuous cycles of partnerships um, so that developing countries can also thrive in these transitions? And they would just emphasize that in the long run, it's in our collective interest that we focus on um, ensuring that developing countries are partners in this greener global economy and not marginalized from it. So All that's right. the perspectives we hear. No, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Carolyn, for, for this very comprehensive uh, you know, overview and snapshot of, of ongoing uh, conversations in Geneva in that space. I, I do have one, one very, very brief follow-up question for you on, on, on aid for trade. We do have a, you know, what, there is the discussion about the failure of climate finance. We do have a, a now running out a, a program uh, for aid for trade um, in, in, in Geneva and a renewal of the program, the integrated framework. You've written about greening aid for trade. Is there any prospect that uh, this facility uh, that is quite substantial for, uh, for LDCs uh, will uh, will receive a um, a significant greening and could perhaps mend some of the concerns that you've just mentioned. Uh, good question. So aid for trade is envisaged as being much more than about the green agenda. For many developing countries, it's critical for their participation in trade in general, capacities of their customs authority, meeting standards and so on. I think there's certainly scope to um, provide additional assistance um, that addresses sustainability concerns and also to integrate green concerns into aid for trade. Um, that's certainly all I would say is, is is yes, we could have more of that. It will depend on the willingness of donor countries to, to support that. But there's also calls to also link that with climate finance more broadly to see these as integrated, um, an integrated discussion where we also need to integrate trade considerations into climate finance as well as a way of leveraging resources. Thanks so much, Karen. Now, uh, when it comes to pragmatic action aimed at finding solutions to the various concerns that we have heard across the board, and, and there are many, um, uh, you know, in, in our problem definition, um, uh, you know, we, we want to talk a little bit and briefly be, because we, we, we have about 15 minutes, 17 minutes remaining um, about your recommendations uh, going into the WTO ministerial, uh, um, both to the WTO membership uh, overall and individual governments, uh, in terms of uh, what you know, as we consider uh, a subsidy reform and an agenda. What is a pragmatic agenda for uh, WTO reform of the subsidies regime? And you know, how how do we sequence uh, from transparency uh, to rulemaking? And we we start with you, Carolyn, and then go in reverse order. Ah, sorry, I thought I was going to be last on this. So I think that there are um, three things that could be done at the WTO. The first is we could look for um, spaces to promote more dialogue on subsidies rules to think about what ought to be some of the principles for such measures, understanding of where the rules work or they don't, um, better understand um, what are the risks and political prospects um, for such changes. As I noted before, I think there's very little chance of real traction on this before we have a wider or broader frame of discussion on green industrial policies um, more broadly. Um, but we can, meanwhile, do work to enhance transparency and empirical analysis of different instruments, understand their economic costs and environmental benefits, 
um, and look at different um, opportunities and pathways to build opportunities for developing countries, for instance. Um, we can do this through a, through a range of different places at the WTO, through the Committee on Trade and Environment, um, through discussions on subsidies and also in the Trade and Development Committee and through member-led initiatives such as TESD. I mean, broadly speaking, I would say that um, we just need to seize at MC13 the opportunity for all members to commit to the to the need for enhanced cooperation on the nexus of climate trade um, and sustainable development at the WHO and discussion on subsidies, what, what are the issues, the concerns, the opportunities in that space would be one of the topics um, that countries could take forward. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, Ilaria. Well, I could just briefly say that uh, I very much agree with everything Caroline has said. <laughs> so um, I I was actually going to say that indeed, uh, if we want to go uh, and talk about pragmatic solutions, certainly um, to go for a soft law model approach is certainly more more concrete and 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 yields probably the best chances of of succeeding already in the short term if you look at the ministerial as was already mentioned there may be a number of opportunities to uh raise high this issue in the agenda and certainly what the wto should look at is to use its various fora um, as mentioned by Caroline, there's the CTE, but there's also the TESD dialogue, where there is a working group on subsidies, which, are, which is already working on gathering evidence on the environmental effects and on the trade impacts of different typologies of green uh, subsidies or subsidies for uh, that are related to the transition to a low carbon economy, um, to be using them for sort of... Uh, you know, providing for a deliberative space for countries, right? So the idea that they can be really used to foster uh, fact-based dialogue, to be, you know, uh, uh, building trust into increased transparency, share experiences, best practices, and ultimately perhaps also work as a sort of a compatibility forum, right? Uh, as was already alluded to by a number of different uh, different institutions, um, already and and i think this would really sort of help the case for the wto to maintain the control uh and perhaps legitimacy on 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 this pace uh, as caroline said i think the future of the wto to a certain extent is going to be determined on the way uh they find solutions to tackle this trade climate nexus and i believe green subsidies and as she mentioned very correctly so green industrial uh, policies is uh, definitely one of the top priorities as we go forward. Thank you, Ilaria. And Julia? Um, look, thanks. I think I'll pick up a few points that, that have been made. Totally agreed that um, subsidies is only one part of green industrial policy or industrial policy larger and, and that there's a whole bunch of instruments in there that you can use which we're not worried about. Uh, in fact, we're looking across the OECD at what we know about industrial policies. But I think there is a good reason to focus on subsidies at this stage because we are at a great risk of a subsidy race. And that's a problem for everybody because if you think of the reasons that we discipline subsidies in the first place, the things we're trying to protect against, we're trying to protect the gains from competition, which is innovation, which is quality and price, not deepest pockets, which is protecting the small from the big, which is also protecting scarce public finances from waste, from cronyism, um, and from opportunity costs from other uses. So, you know, I, I would be inclined to say, like, you know, there's a certain urgency to addressing the, the subsidies issue. That said, I, I think everyone's right that the in addressing subsidies, we can't just look at the new the new subsidies, which is a rich country gain. We need to look at all the subsidies and the, the environmental impacts of existing subsidies across all sectors, um, I think is a, is a critical part of dealing with this. As others have said, I think that in terms of the way forward, there's an awful lot that can be achieved, I think, by clearing the underbrush. So let's have a common understanding of, of what's going on. And this is these are these are very big problems. You don't solve them, but you make them smaller. To what extent can we say, look, okay, here's the continuum. We're going to say we're less worried about that. We're going to focus on this is the nub of the problem, and you know, impact um, fed into that by by analysis. And that 
allows you to then think about either you you have your soft law or you've also really targeted what you're what you're trying to address on the other instruments and i think you know organizations like mine and also with the work we're doing with other ios are, are super keen to help the the multilateral system in this respect because at the end of the day you need everybody to be doing subsidies the only last point i would make in terms of of what's important um is i think that uh, the question of time limited is very important in this respect because some of the lessons, um, you know, uh, from agriculture has been that things that looked okay for the green box in 1995 are now very big um, and are now perhaps looking uh, the the assessment of their distortedness may may change over time. So I think especially in an area where we want innovation, we want rapid change, we need to make sure that we create incentives and rules that aren't propping up activities that should go anyway, but that we're genuinely dealing with transition problems. So I think things that are that are tailored to that uh, is an important um, consideration. I'll leave it there for the moment. Thank you very much, Julia, and uh, and over to Ignacio, um, who uh, you know may mention the WTO use WTO communication on strengthening the deliberative function, uh, but with particular respect to green industrial policies and and subsidies. Uh, yes, I will, but uh, let me let me just try to say I think four things that the WTO could do in MC thirteen that would contribute towards advancing the, the agenda in connection with subsidies uh, and their impact on the environment. I mean, first, I think we should not forget there's already one agreement uh, in the WTO which is based on sustainability considerations, that is the Fisheries Subsidies Agreement. And I think that concluding the second phase uh, of that agreement, which has to tackle some of the more difficult issues linked uh, to sustainability, that I think will be an important contribution that MC13 would make uh, towards the issue of uh, subsidies and environment. Secondly, as I mentioned in my initial introduction, it is very clear that trade distorting domestic support is bad for trade and it is bad uh, for the environment. So from that point of view, trying to find a way to give a new impulse uh, to discussions uh, in the WTO about the uh, reform of trade distorting domestic support would be an important contribution that MC13 could be making the, on the whole question about the trade and environment interface. Certainly, as you mentioned, David, uh, we and many others think that the time has come to have a more structured deliberation to, on the interface between trade and industrial policies, not only green industrial policies, trade and industrial policies with large. This is something which is of great interest to WTO members from many, many different perspectives. It is something which is premature to know where the consequence of the discussion to be negotiating rules, developing best practices, or simply having a better understanding of the issues, where developing countries would also want to come with their own perspective and the challenges that they may face to industrialize, in particularly more vulnerable developing countries, and having the, a structured place to discuss about those issues in the WTO. It is something that we really hope is going to happen in MC13. And of course, subsidies, including green subsidies, will be part of that discussion. It will not be limited to that discussion, but will be part of that discussion. And then I agree that there is a lot of potential for the CTE, or at least the testing, to do more discussion about the whole issues about positive and negative impact of uh, subsidies on the environment. Although, of course, it will have to be part of a broader conversation because there are many other dimensions relating to how the WTO can contribute uh, towards decarbonization of our two broader environmental goals. And subsidies is part of this picture, but it is not by no means the only issue that we have to be that we have to be discussed. So all in all, I think that there's at least uh, four areas where potentially the WTO could do more. As I said, uh, not uh, launching a big uh, negotiation on rules at this point in time. I don't think the moment has come for that, although I would not exclude that, that there is better understanding of the issues and one begins to understand exactly what the different interests of different countries is. 
maybe that's the perspective that one might wish to follow in the medium term. Or in any case, when it comes to agricultural domestic support, what we are really talking at this point in time is about the negotiation. It's not just deliberation, it's actually to find a way to revitalize the negotiations on reductions of trade distorting domestic support. But all in all, I think there's quite a few things that uh, the WTO could potentially do. Although I think there's also some good work that the OECD could do, but I mean, we can leave that for another for another opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. I have one last question for, for everyone that concerns what is the most likely um, and most hopeful you know, outcome of MC13? You know, just just one just one item for, for each of one before before we wrap, wrap up and I and I uh, uh, start with Carolyn. Up from MC13, I would love to see and hope to see a ministerial outcome document that includes a strong paragraph that achieves support from all of the membership on the importance of more attention to climate and sustainability issues in the context of the WGO and that underlines the potential for cooperation. Great. Thank you. Julia. Sorry, Ilaria. Ilaria is first. Thank you. I would believe... Uh... Uh, that uh, another good point would be securing progress towards the entry to force of the fisheries agreement as well. Excellent. Julia? Uh, I may be biased here and we, we try not to tell other organisations uh, of what to do, but I, I think seeing the continued commitment of members to address hard problems multilaterally and even if that's iterative i think the uh that's the signal the, the seriousness of of the seriousness of of efforts to address problems within the the rules based international trading system thank you julia and ignacio well, actually, we just had uh, yesterday a lot of interactions with DG Negoci, so you can imagine that uh, we are fully energized in terms of actually getting the, an ambitious outcome from MC13. My sense is that the four issues which I mentioned are all of them important, are all of them doable. This doesn't mean that they are not difficult. And probably the most difficult one, but also the more important one, will be to be able to conclude at a good level of ambition, efficiently subsidies to agreement. But all the other three issues which I have mentioned, I think, are doable and are important. Thank you very much uh, to all of our speakers. It's a it's a it's a very technical yet uh, you know very multifaceted and, and broad area uh, of, of of cooperation in the WTO and domestically. Um, I, I'm really grateful that you were able to provide our viewers with some of the insights from various perspectives. Um, and uh, and we are in fact uh, you know coming to an end now. And again, very much thank our audience for tuning in uh, today. Uh, looking forward to the outcomes of MC13, hoping that uh, all of all your wishes become true. And uh, and and thank you very much again for for coming uh, for joining this panel today. Uh, um, have a nice day, a uh, good day, and good luck. Take care.